So getting to this uh, second issue, the apples to oranges comparison. Again, this is uh, more been the interest in our, our laboratory where we look at a, a very small volume of interval exercise compared to the traditional approach. Uh, this was uh, a study uh, that we published a couple of years ago now in PLOS. Jenna Gillen in my lab was the, uh, the lead author. Um, getting down about as low as you can go, I think, in terms of interval type uh, exercise. A lot of our previous work had involved Wingate style training, obviously 30 seconds of all out efforts separated by a few minutes of recovery. It was quite rightly pointed out that once you add in the recovery, warm up, cool down phase, the training sessions can last 25 or 30 minutes. So how time efficient uh, is that uh, when you express it relative to public health guidelines? And it's certainly a valid uh, criticism of the work. So we um, influenced uh, in part by some work that was uh, ongoing in the UK. Uh, we came up with this model that we hope no one could uh, argue was uh, time efficient in terms of the training. Uh, the subjects would come in, do a two minute warm up, then they would do a 20 second all out sprint on a bike, basically a, a modified Wingate test against 5% of their body mass, recover for two minutes, do a second sprint, another recovery period, and then a final sprint followed by a three minute cool down. So start to finish, it involved one minute of very intense exercise within a training session that lasted 10 minutes. Most of that 10 minutes, of course, was warm up, cool down and, and recovery. Uh, but even with that, the average heart rate is about 86% over the course of the training session. People do this three times a week for six weeks. Uh, you see a significant improvement in uh, VO2 peak expressed either in an absolute sense or relative sense because there's uh, no associated weight loss that's equivalent to about a, a one met improvement over uh, six weeks. Uh, of course, you need to be mindful when you make these sorts of comparisons, but I would just like to uh, remind everyone, even though most of this audience would not need reminding in this regard of the, the importance of cardiorespiratory fitness as a risk factor for all cause mortality as well as cardiovascular disease. And so if you look at epidemiological uh, data, a difference of, of one med is comparable to these sorts of changes in the more traditional uh, risk factors that you would uh, measure in a, in a physician's uh, office. We were interested in following this study up and, and making a head-to-head -head comparison of this type of sprint interval training model versus more traditional type exercise as you would see reflected in the public health guidelines. And so uh, this is a study that uh, just came out uh, a couple of months ago, also in PLOS, where we were making a comparison of uh, individuals. This was all men in this study. We're doing some parallel studies that are looking specifically at the potential issue of sex-based uh, differences in the adaptive response. So this was all men in this study. Uh, interval training was the protocol that I just showed you. So the three 20-second efforts, uh, workload about 500 watts, but again, it was an all-out pace for these individuals, very low total work per session. The moderate intensity training group, uh, we tried to get them doing 150 minutes per week, broke that up into three 50 minute continuous uh, sessions at an intensity that uh, was equivalent to about 70% of their maximal heart rate uh, and uh, about a five fold greater total work uh, per session. When we looked at the changes, now these are changes over 12 weeks. Uh, what this figure is showing and all the figures will be set up the same way, moderate intensity training on the left sprint training in the middle and a, and a control group uh, on the right. Obviously no changes in the control group. Uh, you can see the improvement in VO2 peak was 19% overall over the 12 weeks. We included a midpoint measurement uh, and it was very similar to that 12% that we saw previously uh, in, uh, in our other study. If you look at the individual data points, uh, they're, they're shown here. So now this is now the absolute change in VO2 peak, almost a two met change. Uh, about six mils per kilogram on, on average. And these are the individual data. Of course, the, the million dollar question is, uh, are these individual differences because of inherent uh, genetic uh, responsiveness to training? Is it due to the nature of the training? We've heard a lot about the conference already about individualizing exercise prescription and individualizing responses. And of course, we really just don't have a, have a sense of that. Uh, I would note, though, consistent with some work that uh, Mike Joyner has, uh, has done, the only quote-unquote non-responder, if you will, occurred in the, uh, the moderate intensity uh, training group. But of course, we don't want to read too much into these data. Uh, we also looked at citrate synthase maximal activity as a measure of content. 
uh, you can see again, despite these big differences in total training volume, uh, the sprint training group was at least um, as uh, the improvement that we saw was at least as great as what we saw in the modern intensity continuous training group. Uh, you see the individual data as well. And certainly in our hands, this has been our, our most ambitious study in terms of trying to get a handle on glycemic control. Uh, we didn't use clamps, but we did use an intravenous glucose tolerance test, which uh, of course is, is highly correlated with the gold standard method. Uh, the key takeaway, uh, as you see, is that again, we saw very similar uh, changes between the interval training and the continuous training group, despite these big differences in the amount of work that, uh, that the individuals did. An interest in our lab is to try and take interval training out of the laboratory. Uh, and that's uh, you know, sensitive this idea that not many people are gonna do Wingate tests on their own. And so we've been doing some work with uh, stair climbing exercise. And so what we did was basically just try to equate the three by 20 second model that's been done on the bike uh, to having people ascend uh, vigorously 20 second, uh, bout, 20 second bouts of stairs, which is about uh, four flights of a typical office tower. Uh, and what we found is that when people do stair climbing, we see very similar improvement in VO2 peak as we've seen before with, uh, with the cycle uh, training. And so you can see a one met improvement within six weeks. And again, these are just 10 minute sessions involving about one minute of vigorous stair climbing, which comes in at an RPE of around 15. So it's, it's, uh, it's vigorous stair climbing, but subjects do not perceive it as, uh, as all out. A lot of us lead very busy time press lives. And so interval training presents a time efficient option to boost fitness and health with less time. Go, 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 go. Nice job. The one minute workout is based on research in our lab where we've had people do as little as three 20 second bursts of hard exercise. So there's typically a short warm up, a little bit of recovery in between, and a cool down. So your time commitment is about 10 minutes. But within that, only one minute of very vigorous exercise. And we've compared it against another group who was doing 50, five zero minutes of continuous exercise three times a week. After several months of training, the improvement in their cardiovascular fitness was the same. The improvement in their blood sugar control, the same. And even molecular and cellular changes in their muscles was the same. Any traditional type of cardio exercise that you're familiar with can be applied in an interval manner. So stair climbing even, running, swimming, elliptical machines, rowing. Our biggest problem is just getting people moving. And so if you're motivated to come to the gym, you're doing the public health guidelines, good on you. But the problem of course, is that most people aren't doing that. And the number one barrier is time. When I talk to my behavioral colleagues, they tell me the more exercise options we can give people, the better. The more menu choices to pick from, the better. So on those days when you don't have that hour block of time, don't blow off your workout. Intervals provide a more convenient way, I think, to fit exercise within your life rather than having to structure your life around exercise.